your first time or you're checking things out, man, whether you're joining us online or you're in the room, we're in a series right now as a church that's walking through our six values. Now, our staff has really been trying to live these out for the last 18 months or so. And now it's gotten to the point where we just need to talk about them as a church. And the reason we're using a series to walk through all of these is because we want clarity. Clarity around who are we? What kind of culture are we trying to establish? How are we going to get to where God is taking us? Our values will frame the answers to those questions. Our, our values really act as if they're guidelines as we continue to move forward. They, they help us make decisions, what to do and what not to do. And really they help us continue to move forward where we activate on them and we can look at our values and say, hey, let's evaluate ourselves. Yeah, we're doing these things. Or we can look at them and say, yeah, we are going for the bronze and we are getting out of the boat and we are making it better. Those are the three that we've already walked through. Ultimately, our values allow us to end up somewhere on purpose because it's so easy to wander through life with no sense of direction. And if we do that, that's a great way to squander any purpose that we have. And as an individual, that's a great way for me to start feeling like, hey, man, do I have any purpose at all? I don't really feel like I have a sense of direction. I don't really know where I'm going. I certainly don't know how I'm going to get there. What kind of purpose do I have? What kind of value do I have? Do I, do I contribute anything to anything? And you're seeing people search far and wide right now. There's a huge search going on today in our world. People are looking for meaning. They're looking for purpose. And what's my purpose? What's my meaning? Where can I be a part of something that has cause? And I think this is one of the driving forces that's underneath the surface of every single cause and social movement that's been popping up over the last couple of years. People want to be a part of cause. They're looking for direction. And maybe I can be a part of this thing. And deep down, I think a lot of people don't necessarily believe or ascribe to what they're involving themselves in. But hey, man, this feels like I'm a part of something that matters. And this is getting me celebrated. People want meaning. People want direction. People want purpose. And the reason you want that is because God's wired that into you. Like you do have value. You do have purpose. And you are supposed to be a part of something that matters. That's God's kingdom. That's his mission to redeem and restore the world. LifeBridge is a church. We are just, we're just a local outpost in that kingdom, trying to live out that mission in northern Colorado. Now, we want to see more people than we could ever count be introduced to Jesus, saved by Jesus, grow more and more into the image of Jesus, and then unleashed into the mission of Jesus by using the gifts, talents, strengths, and experiences that Jesus has given them. And then when we as individuals, if we're all doing that and we come together as a unified church... That's when we're going to see people, places, and generations transformed in such an amazing way that we could have never imagined. Not only in northern Colorado, but that will spread too. Because people that are transformed by the gospel and that are living the gospel out, that always spreads. Always spreads, no matter what. Like we can't help but letting it spread. Our mission, our values allow us to stay on track and, and see that mission accomplished. Our values allow us to stay a part of that vision of transformation so that we end up there on purpose. So we don't just wander through life aimlessly. So that we don't just go through the motions as a church. So that we don't just show up once in a while here, we hang out for a little while and then we go home. That's great. So we don't waste our purpose and our time. Because it's really easy for a church to do. It's really for easy for us to waste it by getting distracted, whether we're majoring in the minors, which is easy to do. Or maybe we just start doing a bunch of activity for activity's sake. And I see this happening with churches all the time. And this is a temptation for us every, every single month that we walk through ministry. We, we have to watch and make sure we don't just do activity just for activity's sake. Because I think a lot of times the temptation is for churches to do activity that feels great. This makes us feel good. But maybe it's actually distracting us from what God's really asking us to do. Where he's really leading us to go, which actually might be a little bit harder. But this activity feels good. We think we're doing some great things. Look how busy we are. Well, yeah, but is it helping us accomplish the mission? If the answer is no, then we have to say no to activities, even if they feel good. Is it accomplishing the vision? Are we allowing to see the vision become a reality? If the answer is no, then we just have to stop doing it, even if it feels good. Our values allow us to stay on track. And another thing that will distract us, another thing that will take us off off track, is if we're all going in different directions. 
Have you ever been in a boat before where you are required to row with other people? Okay, so you know where I'm going with this already. I can tell by the grunts. Yeah, whether it's a rowboat or an inflatable boat or a canoe, what happens when nobody rows in unison or everybody rows in different directions? What happens? Okay, at first, I, can't, I hear the whispers. We can be more confident with this, okay? At first, here's what happens. Everybody gets frustrated, right? You start yelling at each other. It, it happens. Maybe you say, oh, actually, my oar slipped. I'm sorry, as you hit somebody in the gut. Like, that happens, right? You start rowing in different directions, too, and then you go nowhere. Maybe you go in circles, or you end up in these trees that are overhanging the river. You, you end up in a spot where you don't want to be, or you could even flip the boat, a little over a month ago, uh, Kelly and I got to take our kids whitewater rafting near Buena Vista. How many of you have been whitewater rafting before? Such a blast, is it not? That's awesome. Like, I, the, the more dangerous it is, the better for me. I just love it. If The more we can risk death, the more excited I am about this. And my wife is like, we have a seven-year-old. Ah, he'll be fine. He's got a life jacket. Let's go. Man, whitewater rafting is a blast. Like, you're in this raft, this inflatable raft. you got a guide, an expert guide in the back of the boat directing you. Because everybody's got a role. This is not a leisure cruise where you're just sitting in the boat just having a good time. No, you've got a role to play in the boat. And this guide will tell you as you're navigating each set of rapids, it's, it's an art form and a science all together. This guide will tell you exactly when, where, and how many strokes to make as you navigate each set of rapids. And when you're doing that right, when you're listening to the guide, it's crazy how effective and how fun that is getting through it. All you have to do is listen to your guide, look in the same direction, like keep looking forward where you're going, and row in the same direction. The same is true for the church. And the Lord is our guide. He's the guide. And everybody who calls LifeBridge home, if you're part of this church, you have a role to play. We're not just sitting in the boat, hanging out, having a good time. No, like each one of us, you and me both, we've got a role to play in how we're getting where God is taking us. So we can't do our own thing. We can't go in multiple different directions. That's how we end up going nowhere or we might even flip the boat. Instead, we gotta be about teamwork. And that's really at the heart of value number four. Our fourth value as a church is row in the same direction. Row in the same direction. And here's what we mean by this. Here's what we mean. We will work as a team knowing that we will go farther working together in the same direction than we will as individuals working in multiple directions. We will work as a team knowing that we will go farther working together in the same direction than we will as individuals working in multiple directions. That's we're in the same direction. And it seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Like you might be thinking, got it, I get it, we're in the same direction. It's, it's kind of that whole, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go farther, go together. I get it, cool, let's, let's, let's keep moving on. But I think there's a lot of things that are packed into that statement, even as straightforward as it seems. There's some things that we can assume that I want to unpack because assumption can be the enemy of clarity. Where this is coming from is in 1 Corinthians 12. Paul's talking about the makeup of the church and he uses the human body as an illustration for what the church looks like. This is 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. One member being parts. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If we were all a single member or a single body part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, let all rejoice together. So let me play off Paul's analogy here a little bit more. There are so many different body parts, are there not? There's a lot of different body parts, are there not? Okay, yeah, relax. I'm not going to make this an awkward middle school anatomy class, okay? Like, my voice is changing and I'm experiencing changes. In my, we're not going to go there, all right? 
Man, there's so many different body parts, are there not? Yes. yes, there we go. And they're all different and they all have different purposes. Very different parts with very specific purposes. Like your hand is so much different than your eye. Your eye is so much different than your liver. Your liver is so much different than your ankle. And they're all needed. I mean, just think about how your body works too. I mean, your, your body, you can breathe voluntarily or involuntarily. You have cells that will fight off viruses that you don't even know about. Your body can heal itself. Your body can run. It can jump. You can speak coherent language. Some of you can. Like women, women, your body can grow another human life inside you. What? Like that's crazy. The, the human body can do some incredible things. In fact, if you want proof of God, just look at the complexity and the design of the human body. An incredible creation. In fact, you don't even have to look at the whole body. Just look at the complexity of the human eye. That will show you created design, which means there has to be a creator. But that's not the point I'm getting at. That's not what 1 Corinthians 12 is about. All different body parts with all different purposes. They come together like this for one common purpose. Many different parts, one body, one purpose working together. And if any one of the body parts are not working or they're not there, the rest of the body's gonna feel it and react. I mean, just think about your pinky toe. In fact, you probably never think about your pinky toe until you stub it, right? And when you stub it, your entire body reacts. First, your legs react. You bend your knees, you lift up your foot, and then you hop up and down on the other leg. Your arms react, they reach down to grab that toe. Then your face reacts, and you make all kinds of cringing facial expressions that I'm not even going to try to emulate, emulate right now because this is online and y'all can take screenshots. I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> then your mouth reacts, and you yell or you say some colorful metaphors. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? Safe place. Then your eyes react. They start watering. Like your whole body will react. When one part, when there's something wrong with one part, your entire body will know it because the entire body is meant to work together. The same thing is true for the church. Every single individual person that makes up a church has a different role and a different purpose that's meant to come together with everybody else in the church to accomplish the common purpose. And when you as an individual are living out your purpose in our church, that's how we thrive and accomplish the overarching, overarching pr purpose of our church. Life Bridge, our church, our purpose, man, is to see transformation come to northern Colorado through the gospel that continues to multiply for generation, generations after you and I are gone. Like, that's our purpose, and you've got a role in that. And every single person that makes up our church, every person has different gifts, different strengths, different talents, different backgrounds, different stories, different experiences. And our differences are what makes us distinct. And they're needed. Like your hand is completely different than your eye. Both are needed. Do you want to choose between your hand and your eye? The answer is no. You don't want to choose that. Your shoulder is completely different than your ankle. They're both needed. The same thing is true for all of us. Our differences make us distinct. Every single person is a different part, a different role, a different purpose in our church. All are needed. And it's really easy to look at our differences and think, well, that just makes everything really complex. It would be a whole lot easier if we were the same. No, it wouldn't. It'd be weird. I mean, just think about it. If, if, the, if the entire body was the small intestine, I don't know why I picked that one. Uh, <laughs> That would be gross, uh, and we'd get nowhere, wouldn't we? Man, the same thing is true for us. If we're all the same, we get nowhere. We accomplish nothing. All of us are different parts with different gifts, different strengths, different calls, different purposes that we come together as one working in the same direction to see the church's purpose accomplished. And what's really easy to do is to start thinking that there's a hierarchy here, a hierarchy of importance. Whether we want to be honest about it or not, we're all tempted to think that way because that exists in the world. In the world, there is a hierarchy of importance in almost every area of our lives. I mean, just think about it. 
Usually it's the hierarchy based on talent, visibility, charisma, people that are better looking. We think, we think, oh, because this person is more gifted, they're talented, they've got a really magnetic personality, they're confident, they're better looking. Those kind of people, those must be the most important people to, and most valued people to whatever organization or company or group that they're a part of. That's the way the world works. And if we're honest, we allow ourselves to think that way too. But that's not how it's supposed to be in the church. There is no hierarchy of importance here. Just because I'm up on a stage doesn't make me better or more important. You have completely different gifts and strengths that I don't have. And both are needed. Both are critical to our church. And if you're not connected, then the church is at a disadvantage without you. Just like the, just like the body would be at a disadvantage if it didn't have its right hand. And at the same time, if you're not connected to the church, you're not living out your role, then you're going to be at a disadvantage. Because a right hand that's disconnected from a body is useless. It can't do anything. We all have different roles. We all have different strengths. We all have different abilities and talents that God has given us that are meant to come together. We go in the same direction to accomplish the common purpose of the church, the vision, the mission. We've got to do that. But it's really easy to start thinking that there's this hierarchy of importance because I don't have this gift set or because I'm not charismatic enough or because I don't have a good enough resume, don't let that kind of thinking hold you back. I know there's a hierarchy of importance and value everywhere else in our culture, whether it's government, business, nonprofits, schools, teams, relationships. There's just, there's a hierarchy. And you got to work your way up the ladder, not here. And what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fight against that all the time. Fight against letting that creep in. i got to fight against that, so do you. And the biggest temptation that you're going to have is to think that you're not good enough or that you're not worthy or that you don't have this certain set of skills or let's put all the attention on the skills and the gifts that are out in front in public. Who cares? The stuff behind the scenes is just as important, sometimes more important. If you think there's a hierarchy, you're just going to hold yourself back and you're going to hold our church back. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12 says you're indispensable. It says you're indispensable. It said, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker. Okay, let's just say those are the gifts that don't get as much attention or don't get the glory that, that, that accompanies them in the world. The parts that seem weaker are indispensable. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body. This is something that every one of us needs to hear. And maybe you really need to hear this right now. Let's just be really honest about this. All of us were terrified of being dispensable. We are. We're afraid of not being needed. What if I'm just used and then tossed aside? What if there is no use for me and people just decide to get rid of me? We're terrified of that. And if I'm, if I'm dispensable, then, then what, does that, what does that say about me? That, do, do I have any value then at that point? Do I have any meaning? Am I worth anything? Man, you've thought this before. These thoughts have gone through your mind. Are, am I dispensable in my job? Am I dispensable in a relationship? Am I dispensable on a team? Like you've had these thoughts before. And if you haven't, you will. It's a depressing thought. So we're constantly worried about it. Do I fit in? Am I needed here? Am I better prove myself over and over again? Maybe that's where you're at right now with LifeBridge. This is your first time here. Maybe you've just been coming for a couple different times and you're wondering, do I fit in here? Am I needed here? Am I going to be accepted here? This is one of the reasons why people jump around to so many different things. Well, I don't know, maybe, if I, maybe I'll fit in with this organization. Maybe I'll fit in with this group or this worldview or this ideology or this group of people. Maybe I'll fit in here. Maybe this is where I'll find value. Maybe this is where I'll be indispensable. Maybe this is where I'll get celebrated. That's really the thought process on there's so many things that are happening today. Yeah, people want to be accepted, absolutely. That's wired into you. 
People want to be affirmed, absolutely. But maybe more so than anything else, maybe more so than an acceptance and affirmation right now, people are looking to be celebrated. So they attach themselves to things or people or groups or thought processes or worldviews that promise celebration. Because if I'm celebrated, that must mean that I'm indispensable. That's the way our world works. So let me just tell you the truth about that. Every cultural identity, every new social movement, every identity, every new group that comes along, every new cause, everything that you are offered in the world, what you'll be offered today, and then again tomorrow, and then next year, and then 10 years from now, all of the things that the world will offer you you are dispensable, despite what you're told. No matter what, everything the world has to offer you, you are dispensable. That's the truth. Now let me give you some more truth. And here's the great news. Here's where the hope comes in. You are completely indispensable in the church. God did not create you to be dispensable Jesus did not die for someone who he thought was dispensable. And he certainly didn't pass on his mission that has eternal ramifications for the world to someone he thinks is dispensable. You have a part in this purpose. You are indispensable in this church. And maybe you think you're dispensable because of your age. Older or younger. If you are older, again, I will let you assign yourself to that category. I won't be the one that says you're older or not. If you are older, you are even more valuable now as we continue to get younger as a church. We are getting younger and younger as a church, which means if you are older, we need you now more than ever. You're the life experience. You're our wisdom. And if you're younger, don't think, well, I don't have enough experience. I'm not wise enough yet, or I I haven't figured stuff out yet. I'm, I'm too young to do stuff. I'm too young to lead. No, you're our leadership now. You're our vision going forward now. And if you're younger, you have an incredible connecting power with people your age. People that need the hope of the gospel. doesn't matter what age you are. You're indispensable. Or your past. Man, I got a rough past. I, that, that's, that, makes, that takes me out of so many different things. I'm pretty dispensable. No, you're not. You actually need it all the more. The rougher your past is, the more you're going to be able to, rate to relate to people that come in too. You can have empathy with them. You can walk with someone and say, oh, I know what that's like. Well, that part of your story, I've been there. I know how that feels. Here's what God did to me. Here's what God did through me. Here's how I walked out of this with the Lord. Man, your past becomes indispensable. Or your gifts. You have gifts. You have strengths. You have talents. And if you're not even sure what they are, people that you're in relationship with, ask them, they'll tell you. That's just another reason to be connected here. It's another great thing about being in a group, a small group. You can have people that know you, tell you, here's where you're at. Here's where you're good at. Here's what we need from you. No matter what your gifts are, they're indispensable here. A pinky toe is just as valuable as a right hand. Man, like I got, speaking of pinky toes, I cut my pinky toe a number of years ago. Just got it cut, little cut, but it ends up getting infected. When I'm in Brazil, in a very, very remote part of Brazil where there's no medical attention really. Can I tell you how hard it is to walk when your pinky toe is infected? Like there were parts, there there were times I'm thinking, should I just cut the thing off? Would that be better right now? Man, every part is needed. And when you're not there, when you're hurting, man, the whole body hurts. That's why it says we, we suffer together. And then when one of us succeeds, we rejoice together. Just like God's word and the gospel and prayer and grace and truth, just like those things are indispensable in our church, so are you as an individual. We all are. We're all indispensable, which means we're all needed. You have a certain purpose that you need to live out so that we can accomplish the mission that we have collectively as a church and so that we can see the vision we have collectively become reality. The church is made up of indispensable differences rowing in the same direction. But what we gotta guard ourselves against is letting our differences divide us. That's why verse 25 said, hey, show honor to each different person in the body so that there is no division in the body, in the church. Division will derail a church faster than anything else. 
That's why Jesus said a house divided cannot stand. He didn't say a house that has differences or a house that has disagreements. No, a house that's divided can't stand. Disagreement can be a good thing. Disagreement can actually lead to some innovation and and breakthrough. It's a good thing. It makes us better. It sharpens us. Make it better is one of our values. Differences and disagreements can help that, but there's got to be trust. There's got to be trust. There's got to be humility, and we have to be unified on the things that matter, on the things that we can't compromise on. Like We have to have unity as followers of Jesus on our core beliefs, Not based on what our own opinions are or what we think or our feelings or what the world says, but what God's word says, based on that. And we've got to be unified around the mission. We've got to be unified in our relationships, meaning we serve each other, we respect each other, we honor each other, we encourage each other. We've got to be unified in the direction we're going. We've got to be unified in our actions. We can't just be all talk. Yeah, we believe this, let's talk a big game. No, our faith is a faith of action. We've got to go. We gotta be unified in those actions. We can either be unified or we can be divided. There's no other choice. Some of the things that divide us quickly are comparison or celebration. Are we about comparison? We're gonna compare ourselves to other people or compare ourselves to other churches? Whenever we compare ourselves to other people as individuals, that's a great way to bring in jealousy, insecurity, and discouragement real fast. Jealousy, insecurity, and discouragement That is a great cocktail for gossip. And there are a few things that are more destructive and divisive than gossip is. That's what comparison will do. Or are we about celebration? And when this person over here, when they win, when they're succeeding, when God's using them in incredible ways, we celebrate that. Because if one of us wins, we all win. If one of us is having success, we're all having success. If one of us is being used by God in an incredible way, he's using all of us. Do we compare or do we celebrate? Or are we preference-focused or purpose-focused? Preference-focused meaning, hey, I want to do it this way. This is my preference on how things should be done. This is my preference on methodology. This is my preference on all the things that are minors. It's really easy for us to be focused on preference because like we talked about a couple weeks ago, the church for decades is built with consumerism. Consumerism is all preference focused. Have it your way, right? Or are we purpose focused? Where our purpose always trumps our preferences. The purpose of introducing more people to Jesus and leading them in the next steps with them. The purpose of seeing transformation in families, generations all over Northern Colorado. The purpose of making Jesus made famous, not ourselves. Or are we also, are we separated from Jesus? Are we connected to Jesus as individuals? Man, if we're pursuing Jesus as individuals, man, I'm getting after him in my own relationship. I want to know him. I want more of Jesus. I want him to know me. If we're all doing that, I could grief the, the amount of spiritual fruit that we'll see here, the unity we'll have here. Because we're all following the same Jesus. We're pursuing the same God. And we're listening to him. Man, that's only going to bring unity. Or if we're individually separated from Christ, or I'm just a follower of Jesus in namesake only, the Bible's got a lot to say about that. There's a lot of warnings about that. But if we're individually separated from Christ, we're going to be separated from each other too. The more separation we have from each other, the more division just naturally creeps in. I think unity is one of those words that Christians will say, and then we just kind of blow past it. Yeah, unity, good thing, we get it, it's great for the church, let's just move on. But we cannot overstate the importance of unity enough. Unity is not meant to make us feel good, it's not meant for us to be comfortable, and unity is not for conflict avoidance. That's usually the definition we give it. Hey, let's just, let's just not say anything that's controversial or could cause conflict because we don't want people to be uncomfortable and God forbid they get upset. But that's not Unity. That's uniformity. And the only way to achieve uniformity is to get rid of the differences that make us distinct. The differences that God created in all of us put us together in one local church so that we accomplish his purposes. That's it. (laughs) Unity is so much more than that. Unity allows us to row in the same direction. Unity allows us to get somewhere on purpose. Unity keeps us healthy. A divided church is a toxic church. 
every single time. And unity allows us to accomplish the mission. If, if the church is not unified, if there's division here, we will never accomplish the mission, no matter what. I don't care what you say. A divided church cannot accomplish the mission that Jesus gave us. This is so important. I like the, the mission part, we, we just kind of gloss over this, but unity with mission is so important. Here's what I mean. In John 17, this is right before Jesus gets betrayed and then arrested and then crucified. This is his last moment. It's his last prayer. In fact, a lot of people say Matthew 6 is the Lord's prayer. John 17, in my opinion, is the Lord's prayer. This is Jesus getting after it. Right before he's about to fulfill his ultimate purpose, he doesn't pray for his own way. He doesn't pray for blessing. He doesn't pray for anything that you and I would probably pray for if we knew what was about to happen to us like Jesus did. Instead, you know what he prays for? Unity. That's what he prays for. He prays for unity in the church that would come after him. That's us. And the reason why Jesus prays for unity in John 17, here's why. This is verse 17. He says this. May they experience such perfect unity, they is us, such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, that you love them. Remember, we're about them. Them is everyone not named you. That the world would know that you love them as much as you love me. This is why rowing the same direction is a value of ours. Because it allows us to accomplish the mission. Without unity, we will never accomplish the mission. Unity also, when we row in the same direction, unity is an incredible display of God's unconditional love to the people that don't know him yet. To the people in northern Colorado that we're trying to reach the people that we're trying to serve, the people that we're trying to grow, the people that we're trying to bless. And this past week, I got to meet with someone in our church. She's been coming for, I don't know, probably a little over a year. She's wrestling with some stuff. She told me her story, and it's, it's, it's rough. Serious, serious drug addiction. To the point where she lost, she lost her family. She became estranged to her parents, lost kids. She said, it got so bad at one point that she said, I was in a small storage unit shooting up meth, living there. So she was struggling with the unworthiness part. Like, I'm unworthy for grace. I'm unworthy for God. Like, I, she's talking about baptism. She's like, I'm unworthy of, of, for all of that. So I just got to walk her through all the by her standards, the unworthy people in scripture. All right, Moses, that guy was a murderer. David, David, the man after God's own heart, he has an affair with one of his good buddy's wife, gets her pregnant, and then in order to cover up the affair and the pregnancy, he has his friend killed. That's pretty bad. Paul, the guy that wrote 1 Corinthians 12, writes about half the New Testament. Before he came to Christ, he was basically the leader of ISIS, killing Christians and imprisoning them everywhere he could find them. And those are just three. And I walked through a couple different, different examples, but compared to them, all of us, including her, I told her, you're JV when it comes to unworthiness. You're junior varsity compared to them. There's so many people that are more unworthy than you are. But let me tell you what Jesus would do. If he was walking on earth right now, what he would do, I'm not gonna say her name. I'm, try, I'm trying not to say her name. If he, walked by that, if he walked by that storage unit where you're leaned up against the wall sitting down, shooting up meth, what he would have done was he would have walked over to you, sat down next to you, took the needle out of your arm, grabbed your hand, stood you up and said, follow me, I love you. So I said, what happened over the last year? And she said, every time I've come here, said, every time I've been to LifeBridge, I get this. I experienced the unconditional love of God. That's why we were in the same direction. That's why unity matters. And now she's getting baptized in a couple weeks. You have a role. You have a purpose. You have a reason that God has designed you to be here. And maybe you don't know it yet. That's okay. That's why we get in community. We learn it together. 
Without you, we're at a disadvantage. And without this church, you're at a disadvantage. God's called you here for a reason. He's got something for you so that we see more of those stories. Her life's been changed and so is her kids now. And by the way, she's back with her parents. Her mom got baptized here a year ago. We wanna see more of that throughout, throughout Northern Colorado and it's gonna spread beyond Northern Colorado. That's why we're in the same direction as the value of ours. So we see that happen. Father, thank you so much for flexing and being a God that comes to us and saves us and calls on us and gives us different gifts and strengths and says, here, I want you to be a part of my family that's the church. And through you, through the church, I'm gonna do incredible things that you would have never imagined and I'm gonna let you be a part of it. Thank you for that undeserved privilege. Father, somebody here right now is experiencing that thought of I'm dispensable and there's anxiety, there's depression with that. I pray that you would break them of that lie and when you show them how, how you've called them, the purpose that you've given them, give them joy. Father, I pray for the unity of our church. Right now we have unity. I pray that you would strengthen that and increase it. Help us to continue rowing in the same direction so that we give you glory and do what you want us to do as a church. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.